want to tell you about a major initiative that you just heard about, launched earlier this year at MIT. We call it the Quest for Intelligence, and it involves faculty and students from virtually every department of the Institute. And as you heard, it builds on over 60 years of work from MIT, from the founding of the field of artificial intelligence by researchers at MIT and colleagues elsewhere. Let me start by giving you a vision of the kinds of grand challenges that we're tackling and the kinds of uh, places where we think AI and machine learning are going to make big impact over the next few decades. We see breakthroughs in AI and machine learning coming from many places. New algorithms, new mathematical theories, faster computers. But a key idea for us is to couple an understanding of the neuroscience and cognitive science of human intelligence with advances in computational methods. Not only will this increase our understanding of our own intelligence, but we think that current and future insights into how our brain and mind work can dramatically influence future applications of AI. A wonderful example of a moonshot here using this perspective, is to use our knowledge of how young children learn to serve as a basis for creating a computational equivalent. Imagine building a computer system that starts like a newborn and learns to be a two-year-old. Maybe not misbehave the way a two-year-old does, but it le learns at least the intelligence of a two-year-old. Such a platform could not only help us devise and execute experiments on understanding human intelligence, it could also serve as the foundation for the development of a new and possibly radically different generation of machine learning methods. And it could provide insights into educational environments that better support learning. But we want to do more than just explore the foundations of human intelligence. We want to apply those insights to virtually every domain of science, engineering, design, and social sciences, and to seek solutions that have an impact on people's lives. Can we use models of how we as humans process natural language to create systems that combine information from many sources? Images, lab reports, doctor's notes, genetic studies, family histories, all to create highly accurate detection methods and personalized treatment plans for patients suffering from cancer, heart disease, neurodegenerative ailments, and other situations. We also see AI and machine learning methods impacting discovery of new knowledge in other domains. For example, the task of determining the best sequence of reactions to produce a new chemical compound, like a drug, is an art rather than a science. But by training on hundreds of thousands of examples of chemical reactions and their outcomes, new machine learning systems at MIT are showing a remarkable ability to predict a chemical reaction's major product. And by inverting that process, one can dramatically improve the, the ability to create new drugs by knowing what you want to get to and working backwards to decide what are the precursor chemicals you want to use to get there. Same ideas apply in material design, synthetic biology, many other domains. New AI and machine learning systems are not only going to impact science and engineering, they're going to impact organizations, financial, social, medical, civil. So systems at MIT can look at credit card data to determine who is most likely to be delinquent and allow a bank to think about how best to handle risk management. And in this and many other cases, it's going to be crucial that systems can access data without invading our privacy. So workers at MIT have created new techniques that allow, MIT, sorry, allow machine learning systems to, to attack, oh, sorry, wrong phrase, to access encrypted information without breaking the encryption in order to extract information while preserving that privacy, something that we think is crucial in order to preserve our rights. Thus, MIT is coordinating this institute-wide initiative to test these challenges, focusing on the science and engineering of intelligence, but also on that application in every domain and doing it while worrying about the ethical, moral, and societal implications of those methods. The quest has two parts to accomplish this. The first part, the core, focuses on basic questions. Does neuroscience and cognitive science provide new insights into learning algorithms? Can one-shot learning be captured algorithmically? 
Can we use computation as a basis for understanding our own intelligence? Do insights from young children, how they learn, actually help us create the next generation of AI systems? The bridge focuses on making machine learning tools easily applicable to every discipline at MIT. Basic science, engineering, finance, social science, design. Let me give you a couple examples of both of these parts. So understanding our own intelligence, we think might lead to very different ways of thinking about smart applications. And this idea is letting us attack some really fundamental questions about human intelligence. How is it that babies learn from so few examples? How is it that young children can recognize objects and words in a naturally embedded situation, separating out the word and the object without any supervision? How do we achieve common sense reasoning? How do you deal with perceptual awareness, the fact that we can perceive things in natural settings? Let me give you one example of um, uh, addressing this fundamental system. Current deep learning methods show impressive performance on very specific tasks, but they need hundreds of millions of training examples. And yet you can show a two-year-old 10 examples of something and she learns it very quickly. How is this one-shot learning done? Well, colleagues like Josh Tenenbaum and others at MIT are exploring this idea, using an approach that suggests that perhaps young children have in their heads the equivalent of a simulation engine. They can simulate what happens with the physical setting. By using that, one can create a probabilistic program that when seeing a new situation can very reliably predict what is going to happen. When you couple that with models of intent, you potentially have the way of learning from very, very small numbers of examples very effectively. And we'll see if we can build the computational equivalent of a young child. The bridge is the second element. And it aims to make machine learning tools easy to use by anybody, anywhere, at MIT or anywhere else. My way of thinking about it is we'd like those tools to be as easy to use in the future as today we use Word or Excel as a simple tool. To quote President Reif, we want to create bilingual experts that use the language of machine learning as easily as today we use the language of mathematics. In a few minutes, you're going to hear two great examples of applying these kinds of tools uh, in, in other domains. I want to just give you two very simple examples of ways in which people are using them. Two young faculty at MIT, uh, Elsa Olivetti and Stephanie Jagelka, combined to tackle an interesting problem. Elsa wants to create new materials, and she'd like to do it by simply specifying theoretically what are the properties you want of those materials. But to create the material is still an art. By building a natural processing or natural language processing system, their system has read over a million articles from the scientific literature and has learned to detect patterns between precursor materials and crystal structure. Why should that matter? By now inverting the process, one can describe properties of a material and the system will generate suggested recipes of how to create those new materials, many of which have already been verified in the literature. While the project is not done, it suggests that design and materials will now be much easier to do. And the same idea would apply to drug design and other creations of other processes. Let me give you a second example. FinTech, an area of obvious interest to many people. Andrew Lowe has taken machine learning tools and applied them to credit card data looking at different banks and using this to predict which customers are most likely to be delinquent, most likely to cause problems for the banks, and showing as a part of this process that not only can he predict how the banks can manage their risk, but that in fact each bank should use a different process. There is no one solution to it. These kinds of results, these kinds of tools are going to change the way finance is done by applying these machine learning techniques throughout all aspects of how we deal with human life. And one last example. Most of my examples have been in software, but we also know that we need to build physical devices, physical implementations of these. Most current speech and vision systems, and you're going to hear some examples of that, rely on neural nets through densely interconnected modules that interact through simple processors. The problem is those nets are huge, 
They're expensive, and they use a lot of energy. And so most cell phones will not use embedded processors. They will simply ship the data up to the cloud. It's processed there, and it's shipped back down. We'd love to create processors that are designed specifically for neural net computation. So now that Chandra Kassan and others at MIT have done exactly that, creating chips designed to implement neural net computations that are seven to 10 times faster and use 95% less energy, allowing them to be embedded in household devices and cell phones and will create a rapid amplification of the ability to use these devices in many places around all of our uh, daily activities. Thus, the Quest will look at the fundamentals of understanding our intelligence. It will look at applications of intelligent systems in every aspect of science, engineering, design, and social sciences. And what we hope to see is over the next few decades, this will have an impact that changes the way we think about how we create new knowledge, apply that knowledge, tackle the world's great challenges, and finally do it in a way that pays attention to the ethical, moral, and societal implications of using all of that. And we hope we'll turn it around to use our insights to think about what does it tell us about how we learn, how young children learn, and how might we actually educate them better. And with that, that gives you a sense of MIT's quest for intelligence. Shay Shay. <laughs>